And I'm really excited to welcome all of you to Growing Food the Eco-Friendly Way. I am joined by Charlotte Kenner, who is also an IPM advocate and qualified water efficient landscaper and provides our water, our world services throughout the Bay Area counties. And uh, she will be uh, starting us off uh, on our program this afternoon. So take it away, Charlotte. All right, thank you, Suzanne. Thanks everyone for being here tonight. Um, we're excited to talk about growing food the eco-friendly way. And um, let's see what we're gonna go through the slides for about 45 minutes and then we'll have time at the end for questions. We're gonna talk about setting up our food gardens up for success. We are going to talk about how to plant them, how to choose um, the space for them, how to, uh, care for them with fertilizers and uh, building healthy soil, water efficient, um, watering efficiently and effectively, um, benefits of planting cover crops and other um, tools that we can use. And we of course have additional resources for you um, along with the resource page that Suzanne already sent out to you. If you haven't re uh, received that, you can uh, put in the chat and Suzanne will make sure that you receive it. And our sponsor today is the Alameda County Clean Water Program. Uh, this program uh, works to protect Alameda County creeks, wetlands, and the bay from runoff that may carry pollutants into the waterways. Um, so we focus um, on the gardening and pesticide aspects of keeping our waterways clean. So we talk about healthy gardening, reducing the need for pesticides, and how to use uh, them in a safe way. We have done um, several uh, webinars with the Clean Water Program. Some of you may have joined us previously. So what we're gonna talk about today is really just only growing food, um, but there's tons of other topics that we've talked about throughout the last year or so. So feel free to please go on the um, YouTube channel, the Clean Water Program YouTube channel. You can access it through the website um, or you can go to YouTube and type in Clean Water Program Alameda uh, to see our past webinars about drought proofing our garden, um, building healthy soil, gardening for good bugs, weed management, all great topics. And also while you're on the cleanwaterprogram.org website, uh, you can sign up to receive their newsletter, which will have um, you know, uh, events like these webinars on there, other tips for uh, gardening and keeping our waterways clean. So what is Our Water, Our World? For the about 75% of you who don't know, um, it is a program designed to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality, and we provide pest problem solving education. So uh, we work with retailers to provide information to um, the customers and the public. In many retail stores uh, in Alameda County and beyond in the Bay Area, you'll see um, a rack like the photo on the left. In, and again, these are hardware stores, nurseries, um, and Home Depot's, Aces, Independence, all of the several stores. Uh, you'll see a rack like on the left uh, with information sheets that provide um, information about how to manage, identify, manage, and uh, products to use for certain pests. You'll also see uh, some stores have these blue little signs on the shelf that highlight the eco-friendly products on the shelf. And then some stores also have posters with QR codes that you can scan and pull that fact sheet information right up on your phone. Um, and the Our Water, Our World website has all of that information for you as well, including information about um, water quality issues and uh, less toxic products. So why do we talk about uh, you know, pesticides and waterways? Because there is a direct line between the two. In Alameda County, any water that enters the storm drain at the street level goes directly to a waterway. There is no filtration or any treatment in between. So what we're doing in our gardens, on the street, washing our car, walking our dog, gardening, 
everything we do out there has a direct line to our waterways. So we really want to make sure that we're being smart and safe and careful. And we are reducing the amount of pollutants that can get into those storm drains. And one way to do that is to practice integrated pest management. This is what we talk about at Our Water, Our World. Um, so I'm just going to give a quick overview of what IPM, integrated pest management, is, and then we will dive into our veggie gardening. So IPM, it's a decision-making process, and we um, always look at science-based strategies. It's really a holistic view of the garden or the home, depending on where the pests are, um, and really we like to take a step back, looking at the big picture and asking a lot of questions before we take any action. Some of the questions that we might ask are, what really is the problem at hand? A lot of times we might see an issue with plants or uh, with, with our plants that look like could be the problem, but really it's a symptom of a larger problem or a different problem. So we really wanna figure out what's going on with our plant. And another question we might ask is, can we live with it? Some pest issues are uh, cause minimal damage, they're more of a nuisance, or they're short-lived, so we can kind of let them go. Um, and others, of course, are larger, cause damage, and we do need to take action steps. And our steps in integrated pest management, first, prevention. Prevention is really key. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do put in place ahead of the pests to reduce the damage that they cause or reduce their populations. Identification is very important. Um, part of that, what really is going on here, we want to identify the problem. And then if it is a pest, we want to identify the actual ac exact pests that we're looking at. Um, even if it's a rodent, we want to know if it's a mouse or a rat. If it's a bug, we wanna know what kind it is so we can take the best action for that pest. When we do take action, there are four kinds of controls in integrated pest management or actions or at controls, they're, they're just called controls. Um, today, we're mostly gonna be looking at cultural controls, which is bolstering the health of the garden. So if we focus on the health of the garden, we're going to have healthier plants and healthier plants have less pests. They're less attractive to pests and they can fight off pest infestations if, if they do arrive. Other controls are mechanical or physical controls. These are traps, barriers, and tools that we'll use in the garden. Uh, biological controls are the beneficial insects and other organisms out in our yards or the general environment that can help keep pests down. Uh, they help um, create balance. And then lastly is chemical controls. Those are the pesticides. We always use them as a last resort after we've tried all the other options. And we always choose the least uh, toxic option, most eco-friendly and sparing, uh, spraying very sparingly, carefully. Um, and you know sometimes people don't even get to the chemical controls, especially with food. Uh, it's usually not ideal to spray pesticides on food. So, we don't, you know, if something's not working, we might just remove that plant altogether before we choose to spray a pesticide. And so now we're going to talk about how to set your food gardens up for success. As Charlotte mentioned, we are focusing on the cultural controls uh, with this program. Our next program is going to really focus on all the pests and pest management, uh, but this program is just setting up our food gardens for success and looking at, uh, and, and these tools that will prevent a lot of pests that will arrive. So the first step is looking at the sun exposure in your garden. This is a step that I feel some of us might um, overlook. I know for myself, I've cheated a little bit, but being realistic with the sun exposure is going to help our food crops grow and understanding what these uh, uh, sun exposure terms mean. So full sun is going to be six or more hours of direct sunlight. Okay, so no less than six hours of direct sunlight. Part sun, part shade is going to be three to six hours of direct sunlight. And uh, 
when we're looking at the east side of Alameda County, we're really going to look at uh, the morning sun as the preferred three to six hours because uh, that's going to be a cooler sunshine. That afternoon sun is going to be very, very hot. So uh, if that's the case, we're going to want to uh, employ some tools to uh, such as shade cloth uh, in the afternoon if that is the case, if it's the afternoon sun. But uh, ideally, morning sun uh, will be best for part sun, part shade plants. Dappled sun is going to be filtered sun all uh, sunlight all day long, perhaps from a tree or from some type of uh, like lattice or you know or a vine or so forth. And then shade is going to be no direct sunlight, so it will be shaded from a building or a fence or a tree all day long. And then from there, we want to find a location. So many of us have smaller spaces. Some of us have larger spaces. Some of us are very challenged with the type of space we have and we get very creative. But we can grow food in a number of different fashions. We can plant food crops directly in the open ground uh, or perhaps in a raised bed. We can also uh, plant in containers, maybe on a deck or a patio. And then we can also, um, I just wanna note that, you know, planting against the side of a house or a garage might be a hotter location. So just keeping that in mind, especially for some of the cooler areas of the East Bay, uh, that might be beneficial. If we're in a hotter location, you know, like uh, Dublin, Pleasanton, Livermore, maybe we want to avoid those uh, hot walls or the hot fence uh, and maybe try to find a cooler location in the garden. So just keeping that in mind also is going to be helpful. And if we're planting in the ground, a couple of things I just like to share is that we can, uh, you know, uh, we can have a, uh, there's a lot of flexibility in planting in the ground, but sometimes we have to be mindful of the critters such as gophers. And if we are planting in the ground, it would be advised to uh, either plant into gopher baskets to prevent the gophers from eating the root systems of these plants or to uh, dig some areas out and actually lay out and make a basket of that half inch hardware cloth and then backfill and then plant the plants accordingly. But that's just something to keep in mind. And then uh, if we want to plant in raised beds, which is very common and popular, we will line the bottom of that raised bed with gopher wire or that half inch hardware cloth because that will prevent them from uh, crawling up and accessing the root zones. I can also share that when we plant in a raised bed, it is going to save water because we're actually directing water to this very specific zone. OK, so that's something else to keep in mind. It also is going to maybe be a little easier for those of us that uh, maybe are not able to uh, kneel down or to bend down as much. We can plant and raise beds that are a little taller um, and we can make them as tall as we want to. That would be a comfortable uh, work zone for us to tend to. We can also plant in containers. If we are planting in containers though, some such as this galvanized tub, we wanna make sure we've drilled some holes. Uh, drainage holes are very important. We'd wanna drill multiple drainage holes to uh, really encourage and uh, the drainage of that plant. We don't want to have that soil to hold on to too much water because then we can encourage some uh, root rot. So, uh, uh, you know, a nice large size container, I believe this is about mm, three feet in diameter. Uh, I maybe drilled about 12 uh, holes that were the 5 16th of an inch or similar. There we go. Um, once we pick a place to plant our veggie garden, the we should first then focus on our soil because getting that healthy soil is going to help build those healthy plants. And uh, first step 
I'd recommend is uh, compost. Um, compost is all organic matter. So um, when we're uh, focusing on healthy soil, healthy soil is like five, made up of five to 10% organic matter. So adding compost is gonna increase that number. Adding compost to soil increases or improves the soil structure. So if you have clay soil, what it's gonna do is really break up the particles and make it less hard and compact. And it's going to, um, so allow it to water roots and air to move through the soil. If you have sandy soil, compost really uh, sticks those, glues those particles together so that it doesn't just fall apart so easily and holds on to water better. Compost can hold five times its weight in water. So adding that compost to your soil is gonna really increase the water retention of your soil, really turn it into a sponge. That's why there's a picture of a sponge on this slide. We want our soil to act like a sponge. Um, compost releases nutrients over time uh, to your plants and it can filter pollutants from runoff as well. And compost is um, also is chock full of bacteria and fungi and invertebrates um, that those living organisms in the soil. And that's really important because we need those living organisms in the soil. So adding compost increases that. Plants cannot take up uh, the nutrients that we put in the soil through fertilizer and um, decaying matter without the help of bacteria and fungi. It's just like in our gut, um, we can't process food without our gut microbiome. It's the same thing that's happening in the soil that bacteria and fungi is breaking down the organic matter and feeding it to our plants uh, when the plants want it. They kind of have a relationship where they talk to each other and ask for each other, ask uh, nutrients and things from each other. So we want to encourage that bacteria and fungi uh, by adding compost and um, not disturbing our soil too much um, because that's gonna help those thrive. And then more things that we'll talk about will also help that life in the soil. And then if you wanna add soil, uh, so say you're planting in the ground or in a raised bed, you can, it's recommended that, you know, you might not have the best soil to start. So you can um, amend your soil add to your soil with a, a planting mix or comp planting compost or a soil amendment. Sometimes it's just called soil amendment or um, soil booster is one of them I've seen as well. Those products are made to be added to your existing soil in the ground. Whereas if you're planting in pots and containers and there's no existing soil in there, you're gonna wanna go for a potting soil um, or a, some sort of container soil. The difference is that potting soil is basically all in one. It has everything that the plants are gonna need. It has um, the mineral particles, the uh, organic material, um, all of that in there to create, um, to really hold on to moisture, but also to create drainage. Whereas the planting mixes um, are meant to be mixed in with existing soil. So they don't have all of the ingredients in there. And then we're also gonna probably wanna use some organic fertilizers in addition to compost. Uh, veggies are tend to be heavy feeders. So supplying them with lots of nutrients is gonna be really helpful for them. Uh, we do recommend organic fertilizers or slow release fertilizers. Um, organic fertilizers are made out of organic materials, kelp, manure, compost, uh, fish materials, um, fish byproducts, I guess. Uh, other um, organic materials. So they have, they provide a wide array of nutrients instead of just that NPK that other fertilizers have. Um, we want the, the wide range micro and macronutrients for our plants. And when we're adding fertilizer to our soil, again, it's, it, we're feeding the soil and then those microbes are breaking down those nutrients and that material that we're adding to the soil and then feeding our plants the nutrients that the plants ask for. Organic fertilizers also slow, slowly release nutrients over time. So we're avoiding major uh, growth spurts, which can attract pests. And 
organic fertilizers don't run off into local waterways and uh, cause problems. And for veggies and roses, um, it is recommended uh, if you want to really supercharge your veggies to add alfalfa meal. Um, Suzanne says that she uh, does half alfalfa meal and half fertilizer. <laughs> there she is. Um, that alfalfa meal has uh, extra has nitrogen and other trace minerals. That's going to really be a super boost for your soil and or for your plants. And it has a natural fatty acid growth stimulant that I'm not going to try to say, but it is listed there. Um, that's going to make your plants, um, your veggies, and your roses very vigorous, grow very vigorously. Another superfood for your plants and your veggies is earthworm castings. Um, you can have your own worm bin at home uh, if you want. Uh, feel free to ask me about that. I love worms. Um, or you can buy worms, uh, worm castings, which is worm poo, uh, from a nursery or um, hardware store. Uh, the worm castings uh, have a huge array of nutrients and minerals for your plants. They have enzymes and um, that they also have beneficial bacteria that can really help build your soil and help your soil have a nice texture to it. Um, it provides dynamic uh, root growth and plant structure and it can, they can actually help um, inhibit uh, diseases and prevent insect pests as well. Um, compost and earthworm castings can also help your soil um, uh, balance pH as well. So lots of things that we can add. So um, ways to add fertilizer to your soil if you're just starting out, um, easy. Just mix that fertilizer right into your soil before you plant. Um, and then as if you have existing plants, but you want to add some more fertilizer to them, you don't want to disturb them, that's fine. Just sprinkle it around the uh, root zone of the plants, and then you can scratch, gently scratch into the top inch or so of the soil and then water it in, and that fertilizer will break down slowly in that soil. Another way to get nutrients to your soil, with, especially without disturbing your your veggies. So this is a great way um, to work with existing veggies that are already planted is uh, using an, a liquid fertilizer. Uh, so that could be fish emulsion or kelp. Um, and then there's also other kinds as well that are liquid. So this is a great way to keep feeding them throughout the growing season. Um, apply one or two times a month or re recommend that you read the instructions for proper mixing and proper application. And yes, you can uh, apply your liquid fertilizer with um, a watering can. Some might even have like a hose in sprayer depending on what, uh, what product it is. And again, just to review why we really love organic fertilizers versus synthetic fertilizers. So those organic fertilizers are feeding the soil microbiology, they're boosting soil health, prevents growth spurts, which uh, prevents uh, is less attractive to pests. Um, it's not gonna run off into local waterways. You can't burn your plant with organic fertilizer. You can't even over fertilize with organic fertilizer because again, we're feeding the soil. It is uh, upfront, it tends, organic fertilizer might be a little bit more expensive, but over time it's more economical because you use less of it. And it's made from natural materials, from plants and animals and often renewable or and or byproducts. Synthetics, um, on the other hand, they just feed the plant. They're like uh, steroids for your plant, cause it stimulates a lot of new growth, which invites a lot of pests and stresses out your plant, make them less, makes them less vigorous. Synthetic fertilizers can also be quite high in salts, which can uh, cause harm to your soil over time. You can over fertilize and um, burn your plants if you apply too much and that over fertilization can get into waterways and cause um, problems. Synthetic fertilizer can also, often also made from um, chemical industrial processes and fossil fuels. 
And then just a reminder, organic fertilizers for feeding the soil and the soil microorganisms, and they feed the plant when that plant asks for it. And then another great way to help protect our soil and help build healthy soil is to use mulch. I think we talk about mulch in pretty much every uh, program because it's so important, especially as temperatures are heating up. Uh, so mulch is a nice protective layer for your soil. We do recommend an organic mulch like um, bark, wood chips, straw, leaves, compost. Um, it really protects the soil from drying out. When your soil dries out, it gets a nice hard, or not a hard, nice hard layer. And then it, it becomes hydrophobic and then water runs off of it and does not infiltrate it. So if you have a nice layer of mulch on top, um, you're gonna prevent that crust from forming and help water infiltrate. It also um, reduces evaporation significantly because it's a nice thick layer, keeping your soil uh, cool and covered. And so your, the moisture will stay in the soil longer. And it helps, it does keep the soil cooler in the summer, which is great for your plant roots. Your plants do not like wild swings in temperature. Um, and it is important, even with small little veggies, to not crowd the stems of plants with mulch. You do want to keep them away from the plant stems. Uh, just a little bit to give it some airflow so we don't invite fungal diseases. And now I will discuss uh, which plants to grow. So there are so many uh, varieties on the market, uh, either at the garden center or the um, seeds, so many seeds that we can choose. And ultimately we want to uh, grow food crops that uh, is food that we like to eat. Um, there are a few other tricks that I'll share in a moment, but really we wanna look at what is uh, what are some things that you like to eat? And then from there, uh, maybe experimenting and trying um, some new things. It's always fun to try some new things. My favorites though, are to choose heirloom varieties. Heirlooms are going to be uh, plants that um, are open pollinated, are non-GMO and not hybridized. And uh, heirloom uh, food crops are typically coming from Mediterranean climates, similar to ours here in California, which thrive with summer dry uh, conditions. So they're ideal for our climate and uh, heirloom varieties from Mediterranean climates typically grow really deep root systems. So their root systems are deep divers, which means they're going to be very uh, drought tolerant and uh, water savers over time. Uh, keeping in mind that when we do water, we want to uh, water to grow deep root systems. And then once the plants are more established after a number of weeks, then we're going to taper off the frequency of that water but we're still going to provide uh, a nice uh, volume of water. We're gonna get that volume of water out there, but then we're not watering again until the top few inches of that soil has dried out. So during those uh, dog days of summer when the temperatures are really high and it seems like we should be watering every day, our heirloom uh, squashes and um, tomatoes and uh, herbs and other things they're actually doing really well and don't need to, and prefer not to get watered every day uh, because they have nice uh, deep root systems that are still able to access that water. And then we can look at annual food crops. Annual food crops are going to be crops that have a one season life cycle. And those are food crops like chard or kale, summer squash, tomatoes, peppers, and so forth. I know there are a few of you out there that say you can get your tomatoes to grow year round. You work your magic and you protect them. Um, and in some cases, kale can be, uh, you know, uh, a year round, you know, can go a couple of years too. However, for the most part, um, annual crops are going to have a season. They're going to grow uh, in a, a period of time that is less than an entire year. Um, typically, annual food crops are going to require more water because they are um, growing over a period of time. 
and then we're going to harvest them. Uh, if we work with plants that are faster growers, that have a uh, faster uh, from germination to harvest time, then that will be saving water. And or if we're working with like cherry tomatoes or plants that will require, or like lettuces that are cut and come again, we can start harvesting when they're young. These are going to actually um, save water over time, believe it or not. And then uh, perennial food crops. I'm a huge fan of growing perennial food crops. Uh, perennial food crops, once established, are really going to require much less water than our annual food crops and can uh, take a lot less resources and energy as well because we're just planting it one time and we're allowing it to grow again year after year. Some of my favorites, in fact, one of my most favorites are scarlet runner beans. Scarlet runner beans um, are really fun because, especially if you've got kids in the family, because when we harvest them, we open up that bean, the beans are actually a beautiful kind of fuchsia, purple and black. Uh, so I always like to invite children to come to my garden and try to find the magic beans. It's very fun, but they're also delicious. We can harvest them young when they're tender, like a green bean. We can harvest them when they're more mature and cook them up like a stew bean. And then we can of course keep them as a dry bean over the winter months and add them to soups and stews, but also make like refried uh, scarlet runner beans, which is pretty fun. But then also there's going to be artichokes and asparagus, uh, tree collards, um, you know, rhubarb, sorrel, walking onions. If you are not familiar with walking onions, I invite you to check it out. It is really bizarre. I have not yet grown them. Um, maybe Charlotte, you've had the experience with walking onions. I'm not sure, but, uh, they, they're very interesting. Um, and there's a lot of uh, herbs and so forth that are also going to be perennials. So I invite you to uh, look in and expand your food gardens into introducing more perennial crops. And then of course, uh, fruit trees, vines, and berries. These are going to also be perennial crops that are going to give us food uh, year after year. And again, once established are going to really require less water, uh, be way more water efficient, and then also require less resources where we will continue to fertilize them uh, at least a couple times a year, but they won't need as much uh, feeding as our annual food crops. They really reduce, we'll be, um, we'll need to reduce the resources so they will save us time, energy, and money, but uh, will still give us a lot of delicious food. Uh, and then what I wanted to share is that there's a lot of really great resources out there, specifically on the Alameda County Master Gardeners planting. I'm sorry, the Alameda County County Master Gardeners website. This is a planting calendar that I have discovered that I absolutely love. It really focuses on um, planting recommendations west of the East Bay Hills. And then there is also some resources for east of the East Bay Hills. So when there's, when we get um, in the areas that are really hot and dry and get those triple digits. So I would encourage you to check out the Alameda County Master Gardeners website for a lot of really great information on growing food in your area of Alameda County. Um, but then when we go to the store, we have some options. We can either plant uh, food crops as little veggie starts, and they come with these tags that will tell us a lot of information, uh, you know, how many days to harvest, if it's an heirloom, what the spacing can be, um, and sometimes even some water requirements. So these little tags really provide a lot of information. And then similarly, the uh, packet of seeds is going to give us a lot of information. So it's either gonna say cool season or warm season. What we are planting now are crops for the warm season, unless you're in a section of the Bay Area that does get a lot of fog and does stay rather cool through the uh, July, August and September months. And then it'll also tell us how many days till harvest. And that's also gonna be really important because 
If we are new to planting some food crops or we're not as familiar for trying something new, it's always nice to mark your calendar or get your gardening notebook to make some notes on when you planted the seeds or when you transplanted the starts and with an estimated time of when we might be harvesting those crops. Because trust me, I sometimes lose track and then I'm not really sure those carrots look like they're ready and then I pull it out and it's just this little wee thing and it's not really uh, what I expected. So it's always nice to take some notes. And then where we're going to do is we're going to take that tool for buying the little uh, veggie starts. We're going to take our little plant tag and then we're going to score those roots. We really want to open those root systems up so that they can start to grow out and down. And when we're buying cell packs, keep in mind that oftentimes we'll have multiple plants per cell pack. And it is intended that we will massage that soil and those roots to break that soil up and be able to very gently and with a lot of patience uh, divide those plants into individual, uh, in, into individual plantings. So one cell pack, for instance, uh, this lettuce, uh, there was at least six plants per cell pack. So I got a lot of bang for my buck. There was over 36 plants. So I really was able to get a lot of lettuce uh, from one cell pack. So that's where you get a lot of value. And then uh, what I really recommend, one of my favorite things to do is to plant in clusters or on a diamond grid or in a hex pattern, um, anything we can do to uh, plant a little closer than what is recommended. And um, what we can see on the next slide is what it looks like when the plants are growing. And so the reason why I do this is because as the plants grow, they're actually shading the soil, which is going to continue to keep those root zones much cooler, regulate those temperatures, protect those root zones, because as Charlotte mentioned, root zones do not uh, do well with excessive heat and then excessive cold. So when we can protect those root zones and insulate them, that's gonna be really ideal. Something else I can share is that when we have the plants kind of shading their root zones, we're actually using less water. There's less water evaporation. Uh, and a third benefit of planting a little more closely together is that now we are preventing weed seeds from accessing the soil and so they will not germinate. So we are preventing weeds. Now, when we have something planted this densely, the way we harvest is by harvesting every other plant or thinning the outer edges of the plant, you know, uh, harvesting the outer leaves of that uh, kale, for instance, or the chard. And so we'll thin that plant up and give the other plants a little bit more room to grow. So we'll kind of be going through and harvesting like every other plant as we go. And that will continue to allow other plants to fill in and grow. And then we harvest them. And then the other plants have been able to catch up and fill in and grow and so forth. So this is a really efficient way to grow a lot of food in a small space while saving water, uh, uh, reducing weeds and protecting those root zones of our plants. And then for fast growing crops, uh, or crops that will grow uh, if we want to have those carrots through an entire season or those radishes or basil or lettuce. Uh, it's really important to plan out your garden beds for uh, succession planting. So what we're gonna do is plant seeds at the very beginning of a row. And then once they've germinated and start to grow a little bit, then we'll plant uh, seeds in the next and then the next and so forth. So that when, um, when the very last row is just starting to sprout, we are harvesting from the first row. Okay. And then at that point, we can, uh, once we've harvested that first row, we can amend that soil a little bit, add a little bit more fertilizer, and then uh, plant a new crop. And then sometimes if we're planting from seeds, we've, uh, we've sprinkled some seeds on that soil, we've pressed them into place, they start to germinate, and then we 
find that there's a lot of plants. So we will need to thin those plants out so that the plants will have enough room to grow and there won't be uh, any um, root competition that will stunt the growth or prevent those plants from growing appropriately. It is sometimes really sad to thin the plants because you're like, oh, you grew and now I'm just like tossing you to the chickens. But keep in mind, we can always throw the tops of our plants that we've thinned, you know, as, uh, in, as microgreens, we can still enjoy them. And then, okay, I just wanted to make sure, I thought that maybe Charlotte was jumping in now, but companion planting. I will talk a little bit about companion planting because it is one of my most favorite things. Companion planting, companion planting is really important. Uh, it is a, a common phrase that we are hearing a lot more of these days. Uh, companion planting um, does do a couple of things. It allows us to plant, uh, a variety of plants together in a small space that actually grow well together. And what I mean by that is that they're not going to be competing for nutrients in the soil. Okay, that's really important. Another thing we can keep in mind is when we're companion planting, we're actually uh, can utilize some plants uh, we can utilize some of the repelling properties such as these marigolds, okay? They have some repelling properties that are really beneficial to the garden beds. Um, something else I can share is that because we are not growing food for um, uh, economical benefits, not for food production, this is not a, you know, uh, a commercial uh, garden, um, and if you are growing for uh, commercial use, uh, this will not apply to you. But what we, since we don't need to grow for um, uh, for monetary uh, benefit, we don't need to plant into rows. Okay, when we can stagger our plants and intermingle plants together, uh, pests are less likely to find them and less likely to attack them and feed off of them. This is very important, especially for the brassicas. If we're planting cabbages and broccolis and um, things like that, cabbage moths do need to identify that there is enough plant material for it to lay its eggs and for its young to feed on. So if we are uh, dotting our cabbages about, or broccolis about and intermingling it with other plants, we find that uh, we have re reduced the cabbage moth uh, activity. So that's just one example of complant companion planting. And this is a chart that I found um, from uh, the Heirloom Organics website. I have chosen this chart because it's very easy. Uh, it's a very good visual for the purpose of our program. However, as I mentioned in the email, there are many that are, uh, are more extensive and will provide a lot more in-depth information on companion planting for your food crops. So please, by all means, get curious, have a look on the internet for uh, different types of uh, planting charts, for your area and for the types of food crops you like to grow. And something else that I like to share, what's very important, especially to reduce pest problems in the garden and to grow healthier crops is to rotate your crops. This is something that um, is challenging for some people. And I do get some um, comments about this every time I teach a class on growing food. Uh, people will say, but I don't have any extra space. I have a small courtyard garden and I only have one sunny spot that I like to grow my tomatoes every year. Well, what I can encourage you to do or invite you to do is if we're growing the tomatoes in that one container in that sunny spot every year, Put that container up on a little saucer that has some wheels, like a little dolly, as so that you can move it around your garden and get a second container to grow tomatoes in that area. And now we've got uh, uh, your first container where the tomatoes were growing and we can put some lettuces in there or some leafy greens, such as uh, chard or spinach, um, you know, arugula. And then we're going to move that the following year, we're gonna move that sunny spot tomato uh, that we're going to move that container into another section of the garden and we're going to get a new container to plant your tomato 
And then we might add uh, green beans or um, any other type of uh, bean that you might like to grow, or maybe we're gonna grow uh, some root crops like carrots, onions, and beets and so forth. But the point is, is that we really want to change uh, the food crop that we're growing in the soil for a number of reasons, but uh, mainly for um, nutrients. Uh, those, uh, our food crops are heavy feeders. They are creating food for us. So they are utilizing a lot of food as well as you should be feeding them with a lot of food. That's why Charlotte went into so much detail about the organic fertilizers to really arm you with uh, a lot of options. So you could be feeding your food crops throughout the growing season. So after the harvest is over, uh, those food crops, those tomatoes have really used up all of the micro and macronutrients. So it's really important to then amend that soil, add some fresh fertilizer and plant a different crop. Okay, uh, whatever nutrients that the tomatoes are leaving behind are actually going to benefit the other types of crops, be it a root crop, a leaf crop, or a legume. So please do what you can to rotate your crops. Even if it's one raised bed, you can section it off. Um, that's even going to help, but it is nice just to do some type of rotation. And then don't forget to plant your flowers. I see on a regular basis when I'm working in garden centers, folks really eager, they have their uh, baskets and their carts loaded up with all those uh, veggie starts. That's fantastic. But please don't forget to include some flowers. All it takes is a six pack of sweet alyssum or cosmos or anything that looks like a daisy or a sunflower or grows in a cluster of small flowers. And the reason why is because we want to attract our beneficial insects, our pollinators, our birds and other garden allies, all right? So uh, trust me on this. I have a, uh, a three by six raised bed right now of lettuces and spinach. And I did get my six pack of alyssum. And with that space, I only dotted in two little tiny uh, cell packs of alyssum, which I feel those plants are going to grow. It's going to be enough to attract beneficial insects. I will dot my alyssum and my cosmos throughout my garden, as well as planting a lot of biodiversity in other areas. But the idea is, is that a lot of our beneficial insects, the adult form of the beneficial insect is um, going to require nectar and pollen. Okay, they might also feed off of some of the pest insects, such as the soldier beetle and the lady beetle. Uh, however, a lot of the other uh, beneficial insects we find in the garden, such as our green lacewing and our surfeit fly, they are strictly only going for nectar and pollen. Okay. And it's the larval form. It's the larval form of all of these friends that are actually going to be going for that protein meal. And they're going to be eating pest insects like aphids uh, at a very significant rate. So with that said, I'd also like to share, if we do see some pests like aphids in our garden, be patient. We are planting those flowers so that we can invite the beneficial insects and when we have aphids in the garden and other pests, know that that is food for them and they will come, all right? So uh, just um, you know, give it a little bit of time and it's all going to work out. Sunflowers are excellent for pollinators. These are one of my most favorite things to plant every year. I pretty much only plant the sunflowers as seeds for the birds, for our local birds. However, uh, it's a, a great pollinator attractant. Oftentimes I see a lot of our native bees as well as European honeybees and a lot of our uh, micro pollinators just buzzing around the sunflowers. So, um, and then you can also grow some of the really fun, large varieties of sunflowers so that you can harvest the seeds for yourself. And that's always a lot of fun, especially if you've got kids in the family. And another reason to invite beneficial insects, specifically our pollinators, is because it is not unusual for some of our plants to not get uh, pollinated um, and blossom and rot, which happens on our summer squashes, such as zucchini is very common. And that's typically when a pollinator has missed uh, a flower and that flower has, that female flower has grown into that uh, zucchini 
uh, squash, but it has enough energy to grow about three or four inches before it just starts to kind of wither back and rot. Uh, this is typically an indicator that that flower did not get pollinated. If you do not have a significant amount of pollinators in your garden, then you might want to do a little research, find some uh, videos online, such as on YouTube, that will show you how to hand pollinate with a little brush by taking the flower, the male flower, and just kind of tapping it into the female flower. Uh, this is on one of my zucchinis where the majority of the flowers were pollinated. This one happened to be missed. So if you do have one or two uh, squash that do have blossom and rot, don't worry about it. It's okay as long as the majority have it. All right. And I think we're going to, I'll just warn everyone, we're probably going to go over six o'clock, but because we have a couple more topics to talk about, but hopefully you'll stick around and then have questions at the end. Um, so I want to talk about cover crops, another great tool we can use in the garden. Um, great in when you're trying to do that uh, companion planting that Suzanne was talking about. Uh, cover crops are, le are often legumes um, that can really help build the build back the uh, nitrogen and other nutrients in the soil. So what cover crops are, they're uh, generally like uh, cheaper crops um, that don't always provide food or any real product. But what they do is they, uh, they grow easily and quickly. They have nice deep root systems that feed the soil. They promote that, um, uh, relationship in the soil between the, the microorganisms and the plants. Uh, so keep that system going, keep feeding those microorganisms, the bacteria and the fungi. Um, cover crops also cover the soil, which is uh, really, again, important. Soil likes to be covered. So if you don't have an area that's mulched, maybe you want to grow some cover crops to keep that soil shaded and keep that crust from growing on that uh, soil. Um, and then so, so cover crops are great for maybe you don't have a section of your, you're not using, you're not actively growing um, in a section of your veggie garden. Uh, maybe it's a little too cool. So you don't have, you have limited crops growing, maybe throw some cover crops on there. Um, and then it'll just keep that uh, growing, uh, the nutrients and the moisture going in that soil. And I just, we want to show you that, um, Legumes like fava beans um, and other, there's other ones as well, uh, actually add nitrogen back to the soil, which is really important um, when you're planting heavy feeders like tomatoes. Uh, they have these nodules on their roots that actually uh, create and add that nitrogen and put it back into the soil. They're nitrogen fixers is the term. And um, when you are done with the, the cover crops and you want to start planting some other crops as well, uh, you can, it's recommended that instead of, you don't, you don't just pull the plant right out. It's best if you just cut the plant down at the base as close to the soil surface as possible and leave that root zone and the root system in the soil and it'll slowly decompose and continue to add nutrients to your soil. A few I've noticed with fava beans, you might still get a couple of um, stems poking up, re-emerging. Just keep cutting them down. Um, it's, not a, it's not a problem. Eventually that plant will stop growing and decompose in your soil. And the tops, uh, of course, you can, um, you can eat fava beans. Uh, you can also save them for seeds next year. It is uh, recommended though that you, you're, for the most optimal amount of nutrients in your soil, that you cut the plants down, the fava beans down before they grow to seed. So um, you might just see the flowers out um, before, they, before they start forming little seed pods, cut them down, and then you can chop up that material, um, mix it into your soil, add, use it as a mulch, add to your compost pile. It's wonderful for that. Um, and we're going to talk about watering because watering is really important with our veggies. Of course, veggies do tend to use more water as 
as Suzanne was saying, um, annual veggies use more, perennials will use more at first, but then less over time. And then of course the heirlooms are suited to use less over time as well. Switching to a drip irrigation system, if available to you, is going to allow for you to have really efficient localized and deep watering. And it's going to be more efficient because the, um, the drip emit emitters sit right on the soil surface. So the water goes right into the soil. It doesn't blow around like in a sprinkler. So it's much more efficient. And you can place the emitters right where your seedlings are so that those seedlings are getting that direct water. You can set a timer so that the water goes off early in the morning, four to 6 a.m. is the best time to water. Um, and then depending on your soil and the plant needs, you can have multiple start times throughout the morning. You do wanna make sure that you're, you're um, frequently checking the system though, because they're not set it and forget it systems. They do have leaks and breakages. Uh, rodents, rats, and gophers can sometimes chew through um, your irrigation system. So you wanna just make sure that um, there's no breaks and that the emitters are where you want them to be. As your plants grow, you're gonna to wanna to expand, move the emitters away. So if you plant a little seedling like this, of course the emitter is gonna be right here at the base, uh, trying to help that little tiny root system. But as the root system grows, you're gonna to wanna to move those emitters out to really get the entire root system as well. And you can add emitters as well to expand. Um, again, we're going to use water to encourage deep roots. All plants, even little annuals, will benefit from having a nice, healthy root system. So we're going to use water, even if you're not using an irrigation system. Uh, if you're hand watering, that is fine as well. You really want to be focusing, though, on a deep root system. So use water to encourage the roots to go out and down. So we are going to make sure that when we're watering, we're getting the entire root system thoroughly watered. And then we're gonna allow for the top um, <clears throat> half inch, inch, couple of inches, depending on the size of the plant to dry out before we water again, because we don't want our, our roots sitting in water and getting soggy, but they do, uh, they we want the moisture to move through the soil a little bit. So, um, this, um, this shows the difference between shallow watering. If you just water a little bit a day, our roots are going to stay at the soil surface. They're going to be more susceptible to evaporation and temperature swings and disturbance. Whereas if we were watering deeply and infrequently, we're going to encourage those roots down. So they're going to be, uh, have more access to consistent water. And of course we, especially with veggies, we get the plants really small. That could just be a seed. We do water differently as the plants grow. Uh, when they're a seed, they just need moist soil. You don't need to give them a lot of water, but the soil needs to be moist. Um, and then of course, as they grow and their root systems expand, you're gonna make sure that whole root zone is watered and expand out as needed as well and increase the amount of water over time as the root system grows. Same here, when we get our seedlings um, in a, uh, a pack, we're gonna wanna encourage those roots to expand past that four inch square. So uh, we want it to look more like that photo on the right with a nice deep system. And um, it's, it's, sometimes it is hard to tell if we're overwatering or underwatering, and we can't really tell you how much water each um, uh, plant needs. Every yard is different. It depends on the sun, the wind, uh, the slope, the type of soil you have, what you're planting. So the best, what we can tell you is go out and observe. Before you water, stick your hands in the soil, um, is there moisture? Can you feel moisture? Dig down really a couple inches. Can you feel moisture? If not, it's time to water. And then make sure when you're watering to see how deep it is, you want to water thoroughly and then dig down. Sometimes the water kind of just stops after an inch. So you really want to uh, feel down, see how deep it went, continue watering if needed. 
And then of course, before you go out to water again, feel the soil, see if it needs water or not. And then um, as yeah, some of you in the Alameda County live in a very hot climate uh, where full sun is too much for some plants. So you do want to maybe consider uh, protecting your plants from the sun with shade cloth. Uh, 30 to 50 percent shade is ideal for protecting vegetable crops if you have very strong sun. Um, or you can consider a, a whitewash for any trees uh, that you might have that's going to help um, deflect some of the heat and sun from the trunk. And we're not going to talk about pests today. We'll talk about that next. I think May, I forgot, let's see, May. 12th is our next um, yeah. webinar and we're going to yeah, talk about May 12th. We're going to talk about more pests and how to manage them then. But we do want to share that when you do have a pest, it, identification is number one. It's essential. You can't take action on a pest um, or a bug unless you know what it is. 90% of the bugs in the garden are beneficial bugs. So we really want to make sure if we are taking action that we know what that is a pest. Um, if not, we're going to let it do its thing and keep, keep it happy. Uh, when we do see a pest, we want to understand its habitat and when um, the timing it might show up, spring, a lot of aphids show up, so we understand that's happening. Uh, Suzanne used the example before of the uh, cabbage moth. We understand that, you know, uh, brassicas are very attractive to that pest, so we're going to keep an eye out for them or maybe use some tools to prevent them. We want to understand the life cycle of the pests, what they look at like at different um, stages and how to manage them at their different stages and know their natural enemies. And if they're present, we want to nurture those natural enemies and kind of just let them balance each other out. Some um, resources for you. The Our Water, Our World, World website has lots of information about um, common pest problems and how to grow healthy gardens, lawns, roses. The UC statewide IPM program has an amazing uh, website database of basically every pest in California, how to identify it and how to treat it with less toxic options. Um, the bug guide, bugguide.net, great for learning about um, the bugs that you see in the garden, are they good, are they bad, and how to treat them. And the National Pesticide Information Center has information on um, different products and how they work and any risks that they might have. And with that, I want to say thank you to everyone. Thanks for the, to the Clean Water Program for hosting. Um, our next program is May 12th, talking about pest problems. Um, and we will be here for your questions. And of course, if, not, if something doesn't get answered today, you feel free to reach out to us um, with our emails or our Instagram listed on that slide.